Hi, my name's Harold Wilderson. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I have a story for you today. I love to tell a good story. Um, it's my testimony. And testimonies are a wonderful thing, whether it's a testimony from right out of the Bible or if it's a testimony from a brother or sister that uh, something uh, the Lord did and they testify against by our testimony and our, our lives that we live and by the blood of the Lamb that uh, I'm believing for exponential growth in the kingdom. Uh, and uh, in Psalm 37, it says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. The greatest desire of my heart that would be that all would come to Christ and receive him as Savior and Lord and Master and soon coming King and Comforter and Deliverer and, and Encourager and Protector. All the things that are part of the great um, package that we get when we receive Jesus, the benefits package. And sometime I want to um, talk to you about the wonderful benefits package that we have. Uh, but today I want to talk about my new beginning and it goes back i'm 72 so I, it goes back you know 60 uh 65 years ago i guess uh when it all started well i started before that but i was about six years old when this all happened and uh, i remember as a little boy first grade my daddy would get the old bible down on, at breakfast time and read a portion of scripture to us my three sisters edna Ada, and Faye. And I would sit there and listen as Daddy would read God's holy word. He'd put the Bible down and we'd listen as he would pray over us. I remember Daddy praying to God to help us all. Mother, Edna, Ada, little Harold, and Faye, and Daddy himself to live. He would pray for us to live our lives as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. I remember that time and time again he would pray that prayer. And I believe that came true that we would do just that and i believe us kids pretty much followed that uh, in our lives to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves he prayed many truths during his time of prayer that shaped our lives for years to come it was during that time that i felt a tug on my heart it was jesus speaking to me as he has spoken to me for 65 years many times and i've learned to know his voice Yes, that voice has brought me comfort, joy, peace, and love beyond description. It was that love tugging at my little heart that was convicting me of my sins, and I resisted for about three years. During revival meetings back then, um, when the invitation was given, I wanted to say yes to Jesus, but I just couldn't do it. Oh, how I would have done things differently back then if I had only known then what I know now. Oh, the pain that I suffered during the, that time as I became rebellious, big time. I mean, here I was, six years old, and I got really nasty and rebellious toward my parents, toward my mom especially. Daddy was out working on the farm, and I'd be in the house as a little boy, and there wasn't a whole lot that I could do out on the farm at that time. And I got to the point where I resisted my mother's instructions. I would sass her to the point of bringing her to tears. I was just breaking her heart. And I was out of control. I got so bad one day that mother, in tears, told me these three words one more time. She looked me right in the eye and said, One more time, Harold. Oh, I remember it like it was five minutes ago. One more time, and you are going to get it. I had gotten it some, but it wasn't enough to really uh, do the trick yet. And she said, you are really going to get it. I don't think that warning lasted more than maybe five minutes. I was pushing her to the limit. It was only minutes after the warning. And that warning is in capital letters here where I wrote it down with quotes around it. After the warning that I, Harold Wilderson, laid into my mother with a vengeance, it broke her heart. Then with all the love my mother could muster up, she retrieved the paddle. It was an oak paddle. It was designed to stir applesauce. 
It was designed to stir applesauce, but that day it stirred my soul. Oh, how I love you, Lord Jesus. This wasn't easy, but it stirred my soul. It was about 18 inches long, carved out of a piece of oak. It had a, a round handle on it, about an inch and a quarter in diameter. And the rest of that 18 inches, or whatever I say, 18 inches, was the blade. The blade on that thing. And it was 12 inches long. And it was two and a half inch wide, the blade, and a half inch is thick. Maybe I shouldn't be calling it a blade, but I don't think I'd have been more terrified of it if it had been a blade. She took me by the arm and marched me out the back door and up to the old wash house. Back then, wash houses were where you did your laundry. Almost every farm had a wash house. It's where you did your laundry, in addition to processing meat when you butchered. There were two brick furnaces at the back end of the wash house, and they were they each held a, a big butcher kettle, and uh, it sat in, in the furnace, and that's where you cooked your meat. That's also where you heated your water to wash the clothes. When you weren't butchering meat, we used the wash house as a, as a laundry room, and you'd heat your water in the butcher kettle, he had to build a wood fire under the kettle to heat the water. Then that was placed in the old ringer washer sitting there in the middle of the wash house. Mother had an old wooden chair sitting beside the old ringer washer, and the back was off of it. And uh, it just it broke off. It was old. And that's where she'd sit her, set her, set her uh, big galvanized wash tub. And uh, the wash tub caught the clothing as it came through the ringer of the washer and I remember one day getting my finger I was helping my mother wash clothes and I got my fingers uh, in the ringer and it was taking me in and I'm screaming and I'm dancing I, I said one time I said I think I could have given given King David a run for the money in my dancing but I wasn't I wasn't dancing in the spirit like he was I was just dancing from being taken in that big old ringer and my mother came to my rescue. But anyhow, she, she took me up to the wash house. And um, I remember her throwing that old, wash, that old galvanized wash tub off that chair. And she sat down on the chair. And she reached out to me and laid me on the altar of her lap. I must have been as terrified as Isaac that day as Abraham laid him on that altar. Tears were now streaming down her cheeks. She gave me that first swat of the paddle. Now, for those of you who are concerned about child brutality, she didn't beat me with that thing. She spanked me. It was right, as the old timers would say, it was a right good spanking. And, uh, and I needed it desperately. Uh, and I didn't think so then, but she probably was saving my soul from a burning hell. Because I was going down the wrong path fast. Now let's back up to that first crack of that old paddle. I remember screaming out, Mother! Really loud, top of my lungs. We always had to address her as mother. We weren't allowed to call her mom or mummy or mama. Or my daddy was daddy. He wasn't dad or father or pop or whatever. She didn't like having to call her parents as a little girl mom and pop. That's what they said over in Lebanon County where she's from, and uh, so we had to address her as mother, and I yelled, Mother, you're going to kill me. I, I screamed it out. Oh, so scared. The tears streaming down her face. She said these words, and you have probably heard these words as a little kid too, that this hurts me much more than it's hurting you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at that time, I didn't understand the difference between emotional pain and physical pain. Now when I screamed, Mother, you're going to kill me. I screamed it. I you top of my lungs as loud as I could scream. Mother, you're going to kill me. Well, my three sisters were standing outside the wash house. They knew this was serious business. And they were outside listening. Uh, just sh they, were, they were out there shaking in their shoes. Because they were thinking that Mother was actually killing me. They were scared. They're just little girls. And... So they thought mother was killing me, and they told me so after the incident was over. They told me we thought mother was killing you. And, um, well, that's severe spanking. 
must have helped me because years later, I remember hearing her tell people about the incident. And she said that I, Harold Wilderson, turned into the nicest little boy you could ever imagine. And from that point on, I don't think there was any back talk left in any of us four kids. They went through it as I did. They were suffering emotionally and I was suffering physically. And I think I was the one who had to pay the price for all four of us to help us realize that disobedience brings pain. And I was going to title this message today, Disobedience Brings Pain, but I changed it to A New Beginning. And uh, while, you, while we're on the subject of disobedience brings pain, I want to fast forward, and uh, we'll come back to this and where, where I'm leaving off right now. Fast forward to 1989. Our oldest son, Brent, was 10 years old and decided he wanted a motorcycle. Should you have those two things in the same sentence? Wouldn't that be an oxymoron? 10 years old, motorcycle. Uh-uh. Well, he wanted a motorcycle, and he had saved his money. And we had places he could ride there around the farm. He saved up his money and bought a fairly new Honda Trail 90 motorcycle. Had a transmission with a low range and a high range. There was a grassy farm lane that went about a half a mile back through the field uh, for farm tractors and farm equipment and trucks and stuff to travel on. It wasn't paved. It was just grassy. And it had two tracks there where trucks and stuff had gone back and forth. And uh, low range and high range. So um, he, he could ride on that, thing, on that place and not be worried about hit by, being hit by cars or anything. And a Trail 90, uh, some of you might remember, they were a really popular Honda uh, back in the day. Uh, they were a trail bike. You could put it in low range and climb mountains with it. It was, it was a wonderful machine. And... Uh, the gas tank was under the seat instead of between your legs like on most motorcycles. So being only 10 years old, he would go up to the bike, which was leaning towards him on the kickstand, and he'd stand it up. He'd push it away from him, stand it straight up, and, uh, and then he'd give the kickstand a kick to the right. And that's why it's called a kickstand, because you'd kick it. you kick that thing to the right, and now you've got a bike that you're balancing and uh, then he'd strep, step through the bike in front of the seat with his right leg, all the while balancing the bike to keep it from falling on him. The bike was way more, it was way bigger than he was. And if that thing started, losing, started going over top dead center, you better be either run of your life or do your best to stand it back up. And uh, the, he did this, it seemed, almost with ease. Only 10 years old. So while holding the bike up and balancing it to keep it from falling on him, he used his left hand to reach down and turn on the key. Then while balancing the bike, now you can see, you can picture him. He's standing there straddling the frame of the bike with the gas tank behind him, a seat in the gas tank behind him. Uh, he used his right hand then after he turned the key on. Then he used his right hand to flip out the kickstart pedal, the foot pedal for the kickstart. You flip it out. And then he'd jump up in the air and come down on that kick start with his right foot. You always had to turn the choke on for the first kick. Then you turned the choke off for the second kick, and it would start on the second kick. And uh, I remember us boys, some of us had Hondas. Uh, later on when I was 16, some of us had Hondas, and we would say, Honda. And if they had a Suzuki or a Yamaha, it was a Suzuki. <laughs> We'd make fun of our friends that had Suzukis. Made fun of our friends with Yamaha. Yamaha. And we had Honda. And so this was a Honda. I probably talked him into a Honda. That all bikes out there had to be a Honda. And so uh, he'd give that thing a second kit, and it would start up. And you know, um, I did say about turning on the choke. I forgot my place here. Uh, it was started on the second kick. He did all this while keeping it balanced and not falling over on him. Then he'd use his left foot to push the shift pedal into first gear. Now, it was an automatic. You didn't have to shift. You didn't have to use a clutch like some motorcycles. You, you have a clutch with your left hand. And anyhow, uh, he would, uh, where was I? Keeping it balanced, keep it from falling away, first gear, then jump. Well, he put it into gear, then he'd, jump up on the seat and give her the gun and take off. <laughs> what a thrill. Oh, I remembered. I remember riding a, a Honda Trail 90 when I was a kid. And by the way, 
Brent was instructed to never put the bike in high range, so uh, there was a small lever on the side of the transmission where he could just flip it to the right or to the left and it'd take you out of low range into high range. And we warned him, don't ever put it into high range at this point in your life. It, you're too little. It's such a big bike for you. And so he listened to us for a while, anyhow. <laughs> Sometime later, my wife, Karen, was helping Brent get ready for bed when she noticed some severe brush burns on his back and a nasty gash in his elbow. That's when he started one of his first major confessions as a young boy. He said, Mom, and by the way, those scars are still on his body today. He's in his 40s. He's probably 45. He still has those scars to remind him that disobedience brings pain. Uh, He said, Mom, do you remember teaching me that disobedience brings pain? And we had taught him this over the years as a little boy. And she's like... Yes, I remember. And Brent said, well, remember that you and Dad Dad told me to never change the bike into high range? My my wife says, yes, what happened? Well, I put the bike in high range today, and I was cruising back the lane, back this big, long, grassy lane. And that thing would do 55 mile an hour, easy. And it was smooth. That lane was smooth, grassy lane, just nice to ride on. And he said, I put it in high range, and... um, I was cruising back the lane, and I was going pretty fast when I hit something. I don't know what it was, but I was thrown from the bike. And that's why I have all these cuts and bruises. And I would say at this point his angels were watching over him, or he could have easily been killed because I don't. he must have been going a high rate of speed. Brent le- learned the hard way that disobedience brings pain. And now he's teaching his own five children that disobedience brings pain. Now back to my early lesson in life about disobedience bringing pain i was right at the ripe old age of six when i learned my lesson about disobedience i needed to give my heart to jesus i was under conviction but i just couldn't do it i was so scared to stand and when i say stand i have it written down here in capital letters standing is what you did at our church Uh, You didn't go to the altar during the invitational hymn. They would sing just as I am or why not tonight or uh, why do you wait, dear brother? They had all these invitational hymns. And as they sang that after the sermon, that was your chance to give your heart to Jesus. And uh, you would simply stand to your feet and you just stood there and uh, waiting uh, for the guest minister to recognize you standing there. And uh, I was so scared to do this for three years. Uh, and when I did stand, I'm standing there shaking in my shoes because I'm so scared. The preacher saw me stand there, raised his hand high in the air as he looked right at me. That meant I see you standing as you're giving your heart to Jesus. At that point, you could sit down as the angels rejoice over another lost soul being ushered into the kingdom. Oh, what an experience to have that load of sinfulness lifted off of me. I was, I was nine by then. Here I was. My sins were all forgiven. I had, I had, after all these years, stood for my Jesus. That was all well and good, but the job wasn't finished yet. You see, the church I went to, the verse, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And they took this verse seriously. But he that believeth shall be damned, believeth not, shall be damned. I don't talk like that. But it's in the Bible. It's in King James Version. You'll be damned. <laughs> and so I'm just repeating what I read out right out of the King James Version. It's in Mark 16, 16, if you don't believe me. And so it was very important to get baptized immediately upon giving your heart to the Lord. Because if anything happened to you between the time you gave your heart to Jesus and the time you got baptized, if that happened, whether you're in an accident, whether you're older, maybe had a heart attack, whatever, you're doomed. You're going straight to hell. That's what they taught us. And it was, there was a lot of legalism back then, but I'm grateful for all that. I felt like a little ladybug and the the hierarchy of the church had their thumb right above me me being a little ladybug and you better do what we say and you better do it how we say and you do all that and but we're going to squish you that's how i felt as a little boy and so i tried to follow all the rules and so i got baptized well anyhow uh, 
you're going straight to hell if, you, if anything happens to you before you get baptized. And so uh, you do not pass go. You don't collect your $200. You go straight to jail. And as in the Monopoly game, we just said that many times. You're going straight to jail. But in this case, you're going to hell. Uh, so it's very important to get baptized now. Get baptized now before anything happens. So the next morning, which was Sunday, I gave my heart to the Lord on a Saturday night in the middle of December, 1960. And it was a Saturday night. And the next morning we had church. And after church was over, we headed for the first spring house on the Falling Spring Stream. The Falling Spring Stream here in the Chambersburg area is a very uh, well-known spring. I remember back uh, big news in Chambersburg when President Clinton came to fish in our little Falling Spring Stream. It was great fishing. A lot of guys go fly fishing in there. I don't know much about fishing, but it was, it was a well. It still is a well-known stream. And people like to fish in it. And we all gathered there as a group. At the first spring house there on the Falling Spring Stream, uh, probably up the road, maybe three miles from my home, four at the most, I would say. And we all gathered there as a group of believers. And when it was my turn, I was led down those steps to the water where I was going to be baptized. They had concrete uh, piers at both sides of the opening from the spring house, little pond there. Uh, and it had slots in it where you could put two or six planks in and raise the level high enough so that you could get down in there and get baptized. And then when they immersed you, they immersed you and you went all the way under. Your back went clear under. You were you got baptized three times forward. Uh, so, so I was, uh, if you remember that I was shaking in my shoes when I stood for Jesus, that was nothing compared to shaking all over. I was, I was just almost in convulsions, convulsion, just shaking. My whole body was just shaking because it was so cold middle of December I went down the steps and as soon as your feet hit that cold water it was just like I know people do that nowadays I have a nephew that gets a big tub in the middle of the winter and he'll put ice in it and he'll get in that thing for so many minutes and it's supposed to be such good therapy well it was good therapy for me it was cold and I went down there first time down and uh, three times forward in the name of the father in the name of the son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, third time down. Uh, the minister, the minister who was baptizing you would then put his hands on your head and pray a beautiful prayer over you. That's when you were officially saved. Oh, I remember coming up those steps just shaking uncontrollably. When I got to the top of the steps, I was greeted by several deacons' wives who wrapped me in towels and blankets. It was like... It felt like I had died and gone to heaven. Wow. I felt like a hundred tons of weight was lifted off of me. I was now saved. I was raised up into new life. That was my new beginning. That's what we're going to talk. That's what we're talking about today. My new beginning. It was so exciting. I wanted everybody to get saved. And I will say, I don't know of ever hearing of anybody that got baptized in the middle of the winter outside in a farm pond or wherever it was that ever got sick. I don't remember ever hearing any story like that. And I think it was my mother or else her sister. When they got saved, they got baptized right away. And it was, I don't know what month it was, but the pond was frozen over. And the men got in there and broke the ice on the pond and got the ice pe peeled back or broken back. And so that you get down there, two people get down there and get baptized. And that's how cold it was. But nobody ever got sick that I know of. And um, so... Um, I was so excited. Nine years old. I was the happiest little boy. I wasn't perfect, but I was saved. I was forgiven. Jesus was just what I needed. Jesus was just what I needed. And I, I tell you this story so that you don't have to go through the torture that I went through as I resisted the greatest gift that God could give ever. Oh, the joy of serving Jesus. Oh, the love I felt in my heart. And the peace was indescribable. Up until I gave my heart to Jesus, I remember dreaming of dying. I remember dying in my dreams and going to hell. And I remember getting out of my bed and hit, my knees would hit the floor. And I, my heart would be just pounding out of my chest. And pleading with God to help me. I was so scared. This was the time between six and nine, I guess, when I was under conviction and wouldn't do anything. I was scared. And uh, I remember after I got saved, I remember my dreams changed. I remember one night, it was probably one of the best dreams I've ever had in all my life. I could take you right to the spot 
at the old home place where I grew up, back behind the wash house. I remember going there. Uh, I was back behind the wash house, and I remember in my dream, uh, and I remember right where I was standing, and in my dream, the rapture happened. I remember shooting straight up off the earth. The G-force, somehow I knew something about G-force. I knew it was pretty severe. The G-force was so great as I lifted off, it felt like all my guts went straight down into my pelvis, wrapped around my pelvis. That's how much, how painful it was. It was actually painful in my dream. I actually felt the pain in my dream. It's probably what woke me up. But it was the greatest feeling of pain ever. <laughs> I, I woke up from that most wonderful dream I'd ever experienced in my life. And I lay there in my bed so happy to have seen a small glimpse of things to come. And I'm looking forward to the rapture. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. I want, before we get to the end, I, want, I just want to, I can't wait any longer. I got I to gotta just pray a little bit here for uh, us. Oh, when, I'm, when I'm telling these stories and stuff, I'm just remembering and I'm rejoicing over what God did for me. And I want you to rejoice as you go through your life and as you receive Jesus as your Savior. And so I want to say this to the Lord. Oh, Lord God, you said in your word, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That's in Psalm 37. So Lord, you know my deepest heart's desire is that all would receive you as their Savior, as Lord, as Master, Healer, Encourager, Comforter, and Protector, and soon coming King. May each person who's listening here today receive you and then bring their brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles and cousins and grandmas and grandpas and all their friends into the kingdom. Then in turn, by their lives and by their testimonies and by the blood of the Lamb, being filled with your Holy Spirit, bring all their offspring down to 10,000 generations or more, if that's how long it is till you return, Lord, till the rapture happens. Uh, I just don't want to miss anybody. So down to 10,000 generations, I'm going to say or more because I know when I ask you for something, if I need $100, I always say, Lord, I need $100 or more just because I don't want to limit you, Lord. Uh, and that there would be in, come into your kingdom exponential growth through the lives and the testimonies of these who have come to you and received you as their Savior. Uh, our desire is that not one should perish. And we love you, Lord. And we adore you. We praise you. And we worship you. For you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. That was um, the new beginning that I wanted to tell you about. And if I had time, and I think I do have a little bit of time, I have about 10 minutes left, uh, I, uh, I was going to talk about this next time, and that would be spiritual mollification. And uh, I just wanted to hit on this a little bit. Once you get saved, when you get saved, you want everybody to get saved. And then later on, you get through life, you start going through life, you're getting older, and it's like, eh, I'm saved, I don't care about anybody else. I, it's not nice to say, but sometimes we get that way as Christians. Just so I'm saved, just so I get to heaven. If the rest of the people, my neighbors and people around me don't get saved, well, that's too bad. They should have. Somebody should have helped them get saved. But one time years ago, I remember somebody saying that if your boss would come up to you someday and tell you that uh, for the next month, for one whole month, starting at beginning of the month, uh, he, he would just give you $100,000 for the month. Or you could simply... Let me pay you a penny the first day, and then I'll pay you a penny, two pennies the second day. And I just keep doubling your income every day. And uh, almost everybody says, I'll take the $100,000. And then after they say that, uh, and I want to say this too. When each one won, each one, O-N-E, won, W-O-N, won to Jesus. If each one won, won, won. If each one of us, if that's the only thing you ever did in all your life, you just won one other person to Jesus. So if each one won, 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 what great numbers would be won when everybody won would win, win, won, and when everybody won, won, won. Okay, that's a lot of ones, but it makes sense if you slow down and, and listen. And as a little boy, nine years old, ripe old age of nine years, 
uh, I wanted everybody to be saved, and I still do. And it's what Jesus, in the Word, it says, and he would that not any should perish. And so uh, as we become Christians, we go out and we reach others for Jesus. And sometimes you won't actually reach that person for Jesus. You'll just plant a seed. And in eternity, in heaven, I'm going to tell you ahead of time so you know, so you remember what I said. Somebody will come up to you and say, Billy, Jane, Sally, uh, Charles, do you remember back on January 22nd, uh, 1942 or 2010 or whenever it was, you said to me these words and you won't remember what you said, but they remember and you planted a seed in their heart and it might have been the next day, it might have been that day, it might have been 10 years from there, but they tell you that's what started me on the road to being a Christian. You planted a seed in my heart and sometimes that's all you get to do and somebody else waters this seed and then the Lord sends rain and sends the sunshine and in the end there's exponential growth in the kingdom because uh, they went on to share with others and but you planted the seed maybe it was a word of encouragement a word of comfort etc and I just want to quickly say this uh, some time ago somebody said to me do you know that any one of us could count open up an apple cut it open and count all the seeds in that apple if I remember right when I did it it might have been six or eight seeds in that apple and any of us can do that but only God can count the apples in a seed that's something you have to think about for a while to get the full force of it um, so wouldn't it be great if you could in a sense take a penny and double it every day for 31 days I did that I've done it several times in my life and um you take a penny, the first day of the month you get a, a penny, second day you double it and you have two cents, third day four cents, eight cents, 16 cents, 32 cents, 64 cents, a dollar 28, then two dollars and 56 cents, you're into the dollars now, and by day 15 you're at 160 dollars, and day 21 you're at uh, 10,000 dollars, and then day 22, 20,000 dollars, and 40,000, 80,000, 160,000 dollars. Day 27, you're at 640,000 dollars. And you done told the boss you only wanted, just give me 100,000 dollars for the month. Well, you blew it because you could have gotten a lot more. Uh, then day 25, 1,280,000. Day 29, 2,500,000. Day 30, 5 million. And day 31, 10 million. When you add it all up for the month, it comes out to, I, I'm not sure the exact number, but I think it was like 19 or $20,000, 19 or $20 million. Now, wouldn't it be great if we would do some spiritual multiplication and do just that? You lead somebody to Jesus and you teach them. You teach them, you need to go out and share it with others. You need to bring somebody else into the kingdom. And so they do that. And so now, and you do the same thing. And you bring somebody else in the king. They bring somebody else in the king. Now instead of just two of you, there's four of us that are Christians serving the Lord. Then you keep teaching these people. You keep working down line with these people, staying in touch and encouraging them to reach out and help somebody into the kingdom. And so you do that. And let's say you only do that one time in your life. By the, and you only do that... Uh, one time you like after a while you got these numbers like ten million that have come into the kingdom through your life, your testimony, and by the blood of the Lamb. It's possible if we just get on it and as I said before, full steam ahead, get out there and bring people into the kingdom. And so uh I just want to leave you with this challenge to just whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. I told somebody that just recently. I said, if you don't like your job, just do it unto the Lord. Pretend you're doing it for Jesus. And it'll be so much more fulfilling uh, as you go about your work that you're just not doing it to make your boss rich and you don't get much of anything, maybe. You're getting paid minimum wage, maybe. Uh, and maybe uh, you could do better and maybe get more than minimum wage. But uh, if that's how you feel about your job, you like your work, but you don't like how you're being treated, uh, but if you do it as unto Jesus, as a Christian, you can do that. And it's how you think. Jesus said, as man thinketh, so is he. You can have joy in your heart while you do those 
menial tasks or whatever it is that you have at your job, you can have joy in your heart, love and joy and peace in your heart as you go about go about your father's business. And it's, it makes life so much more exciting. So let's go out. Let's let's do some spiritual multiplication here. Uh, what would happen if you brought somebody into the kingdom every month? I mean, how many people do you talk to in the in a month? What if you what if you brought somebody into the kingdom each month? I remember bringing somebody into the kingdom just here recently in the last couple of months. But that's something I could do every day. I remember leading this little lady to Christ. She wanted to receive Jesus as Savior right there on the spot. I led her in the sinner's prayer and she became, she's a saint now. She's, uh, and we don't like to call ourselves saints, but she is a saint. Uh, Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians at Ephesus, he said to the saints at Ephesus. Uh, and so we are saints and you just need to admit it. And you're righteous. And you're righteous through Jesus, through the blood that he shed. Oh, I forgot to turn my phone off before I walked in here. I'm sorry. Get that thing, Harold. There we go. Uh, my time's almost up, too. So Let, what, what would happen if we all did that every, every month uh, for instead of 31 days, for 31 years? Let's say you're 20 right now. 31 years later, you're 51. And every month... You're actually doubling what you started with. You and one other person. And then there's you and that person bring in a person per month. And if you did that for 31 years, you just did it once a month. And you did it uh, for 31 years. Or 31 months, I should say. 31 months. You'd be at, you'd be at somewhere close to 20 million people into the kingdom through your life. And your friends and those friends, friends, and friends, 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 down to uh, however many, 31 generations, I guess you'd say. It would be a way to say it. 20 million more people in the kingdom just because you believed in spiritual multiplication. And God can help you to do that if that's your heart's desire. And it should be all of our heart's desires to go and bring them in. I remember at the church I went to, I was one of the, uh, we called them song leaders. Sometimes they said I was a chorister. And that meant you stood up and you you directed the music. And there was no musical instruments. It was just a cappella. And you'd stand up. And I remember one of my favorite songs to sing. And I still love to sing it. Sit down at my piano and sing the song, Bring Them In. How many of you know the song, Bring Them In? Bring Them In. Bring Them In from the Fields of Sin. And it starts out, Hark, tis the master's voice I hear. Out in the desert. So dark and so drear. And he's calling the... Sheep who've gone astray, far from the shepherd's fold away. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Oh, I could just sing it right now. I just wish I had my piano and I'd just sing it to you. The Lord's been really good to me. Uh, I had that beautiful beginning when I was nine years old. And it's been 65 years, I guess. And uh, I am not sorry that I made that decision to receive Jesus as my Savior. And I've been living for him. I've had my ups and downs. I've made some mistakes. We're not perfect, but we're saved. We're redeemed. We're filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, we just have so many things to be grateful for in our walk with the Lord. And we're going to finish up here. I just want to say that I really appreciate you allowing me to uh, have this conversation with you. And when I, when I talk to you, I'm talking to me. And I'm encouraging myself. If I'm uh, in a preachy mode, I'm preaching to myself. And I, I just want to say that uh, when I pray, one of the first things I tell the Lord is, look, Lord, I'm so grateful that you're the vine and I'm a branch. I'm hooked up to the right, the right tree, the right vine. Um, you're the vine, I'm a branch. And as I abide in you and you abide in me, we bear much fruit. So even if you're all by yourself, Jesus said if two or three agree is touching anything, it will be done in my father. I will do it for you. Uh, if you're all by yourself, you still have two or three. You still have two because it's you and Jesus. Because without him, you can do nothing. And so we bear much fruit. Jesus and us together will bear much fruit. Much fruit. If you're a Christian and you're going to bear fruit, guess what kind of fruit you're going to bear? It's not going to be peaches or blueberries or apples. It's going to be more Christians. And if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be cut off and thrown into the fire. That's pretty serious business. And so that's how I want to close today. 
go out and bear much fruit and just be a blessing everywhere you go. And wherever you go, just glow. And people will see the glow in your face and want to know what you have. Uh, I have just a minute or two. I, I just want to say this. I want to confess one of my sins. Way back, I was probably 25 or 30 years old. I was at a local lumber company. And I went up to pay my bill up, it was up on a higher level in the store. The, sh- the buildings, were, the roof and the, the ceiling in the front office was probably 15, 20 feet high. And I walked up to the next level. And I was paying my bill. And the girl, the secretary, looked at me and she said, Harold, there's something different about you. What is it? I want what you got. And I very sheepishly said, well, maybe sometime we have a chance to talk or something. I was just, I wasn't as on fire for the Lord at that point in my life. And I just kind of blew it off and, and said, well, maybe later we'll talk about it. And I never, I don't think I ever saw that dear lady again in all my life. And I pray for her. Lord, help her somehow that somebody else will be able to share the gospel with her. And that she will have received Jesus as her Savior. Don't make those kind of mistakes. Open up your mouth. Full steam ahead. Tell them about Jesus. Even if you only have a minute or two, plant a seed at least. And maybe they can have a new beginning. Just like you had when you received Jesus. Just like I had when I had received Jesus. And it's a brand new beginning and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And we have so much to be grateful for. I love you all. In Jesus' name, amen.